This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the second video for Unit 10 on the cardiovascular system. In this video, I'll be covering the, un the learning targets under Goals 2 and 3. Most of what I'm going to be talking about in this video are the blood vessels. So let's start with just some introductory organ information about blood vessels. They are considered an organ in the cardiovascular system along with the heart. And the blood vessels, as you already know, form a closed circuit. Arteries carry blood from the heart, they pass into arterioles, which go to the capillaries. At the capillary level, that's where you have the nutrient and waste exchange happening between the blood cells and the plasma of the blood and the body cells. Then the blood moves from capillaries into venules and from venules into vein, back veins back to the heart. The structures of arteries and veins are very similar, though the thickness of the walls are different. So here we have arteries on the left and veins on the right using red and blue as just sort of the traditional colors for referring to arteries and veins. You can see that there are three levels, three layers I mean, around the outside of these blood vessels. They are known as layers or tunics. The most interior level is the tunica interna or the tunica intima. And this is the layer of epithelial cells. It is the one that stays constant all the way down to the capillary level because your capillaries, which are illustrated here on the bottom, basically are just that internal tunica interna. Surrounding that, and since these are epithelial cells, you have a basement membrane. But then surrounding that, you have a smooth muscle layer, which again is much thicker in the arteries in the vein. This is the tunica media. media and the... Um, you can see from this drawing that it's much thicker in arteries than it is in veins. There's elastic cells often surrounding the tunica media. And then at the very outermost level, you have a layer of connective tissue, the tunica externa, or the tunica adventitia. So the three layers are, are found in both arteries and veins, but the composition of these layers and the thickness of the layers differs greatly between arteries and veins. And this is mainly because arteries are a high-pressure system taking the pressure wave of blood from the heart, whereas veins are a low-pressure system, so they don't need quite so thick walls. You can see down here, looking again at the capillary, that it is just basically the internal most layer, the tunica interna. And it really is, when at the very um, thinnest edge of a capillary, it is only as large as one blood cell. So here are some actual slides to look at. This, last, this slide over here on the bottom left is an example of that capillary down at the very smallest level where you can see these blood cells are just passing through and this is just big enough for one blood cell. The picture right above it is a cross section of an artery. So you can see here's the most external part of the artery and then there's a nice thick wall before we get to the internal section. The empty space in the middle is called the lumen. We've seen that word before with some other structures. And then down here on the right corner we have both an artery, a small artery, and a vein. And you can see the difference in the thickness of the wall as you look at these slides. So let's start with arteries and arterioles, talk about them a little bit more. Both of these have three layers, or the three tunics, but they're much thicker, of course, in your arteries. <clears throat> so the thick, strong wall in the artery so that it can take the high pressure of the blood pushing out a pressure wave, so almost a, a bolus or bulge of blood goes out every time the ventricles contract. The arterioles are uh, not so dense in smooth muscle tissue, but there's enough smooth muscle tissue so that they can control the blood flow into a capillary. You do not have blood flowing through every single one of your capillaries all the time. Your body is able to turn on and turn off sections of capillary beds depending upon what's going on. Are you exercising your muscles and they really need to have that blood flow or are you resting and you're not doing very much with your legs? but you're sitting there digesting your lunch, whereas your, your intestinal system needs the blood flow. So that these arterioles have the opening and closing ability with the capillaries. So just to kind of look at that, we see here there's a pre-capillary sphincter that is at the uh, interface between the arterioles and the capillaries. And so if it closes, if that muscle contracts, it's a circular muscle, and so it will close off that opening and blood flow will not go through the capillaries. 
But of course, since blood needs to circulate from arteries to veins, you will always have a um, direct path, as we see here, for the blood to go through. If it's not going to go through in a particular capillary bed, it will have a way to get from the artery side of the body to the venous side of the body. The capillaries, of course, are your smallest blood vessels, and they touch nearly every cell in your body. You know already that the cells in your cornea and your lens do not have a vascular supply, and many of your connective tissues do not have very much of a vascular supply. But in general, the rest of your body is connected somehow to every capillary. They connect between the smallest arteriole and the smallest, smallest venule, and they're really just extensions of that inner lining of endothelium that you see that's coming present right from the heart coating the inside of the chambers of the heart to the inside of the chambers of your aorta and your other blood vessels down to the capillaries and back. It's all continuous. Capillaries are also semi-permeable. The amount of space between the um, epithelial cells in the capillary varies depending upon where the capillaries are found. The ones in your brain, of course, have very tight junctions. That's the blood-brain barrier. But the ones in your kidneys and your liver have very loose junctions, lots of space in between for things to move out of the bloodstream and then into the interstitial fluid that surrounds the body cells. Here are some pictures of capillaries. This is stained, but it's uh, capillaries from the skin, so you can see how dense the capillary bed is there. This picture over here on the right is a rabbit, as you can tell, and it's from an exhibit called Body Worlds. If you ever have a chance to see that, I would strongly recommend it. It um, depicts a technique developed by German scientists of plasticizing many parts of bodies. It was developed in order to help medical students in their training, but they now have traveling exhibits, and you can see the most of their uh, exhibits are of human bodies. People donate their bodies after death to be used for the Body Worlds exhibit. But here they have show they're showing the capillaries, they're showing the blood vessels, but especially the capillaries in a rabbit, and you can see that it basically covers all of the body. You can imagine the shape of the the fur over this rabbit, and so the capillaries are going to nearly every cell. At the capillaries, this is where you have your nutrient uptake by the cells and the waste uh, giving off. At the some, some substances, the gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, and small lipid soluble molecules just diffuse through the cell walls. And so they don't have to be transported, they just move down the concentration gradient from areas of high concentration towards areas of lower concentration. Molecules such as glucose and some amino acids and many of your ions are moving via a channel or a carrier protein. And remember that a channel um, will open or close based on outside triggers. Carrier proteins can be also just handled by environmental triggers and be passive, not requiring energy. We call that facilitated, diff facilitated diffusion. Or if ATP is needed, then it's active transport. We covered that way back at the beginning of the year. But also glucose and some of your ions and even larger molecules are sliding out between that semi-permeable nature of the capillaries. The smallest space is called an intercellular cleft, and if it's a little bit larger, it's called a fenestration. Some large proteins are moved by cytosis into and out of cells, and then water, of course, is always moving by osmosis. So we have several pictures to depict these various ways that things move. So in this first one, we've got diffusion of molecules. This would be your oxygen or carbon dioxide or small lipid solid molecules. Basically can just slide through the cell membranes of the epithelial cells that make up the walls of the capillaries, slide through the cell membranes of the body cells. On this section B over here, we've got the uh, intercellular cleft being shown where things can move through this little space between cells or also a larger space, a pore, there's a membrane door there on a fenestration. And then this last picture at the bottom is showing that at the ar artery end of the capillary, the blood has more pressure because it's being pushed by the contractions of the ventricles of the heart. And so this higher blood pressure tends to force things out Remember, we talked about filtration as one of the transport mechanisms back at the beginning of the year. So uh, fluids are filtered out because of blood pressure, 
and there is a small amount of osmotic pressure because of the presence of proteins and such in the blood to pull the water back in. But really, the blood pressure is pushing more out than pushing in on the artery end of the capillary. But on the venous end of the capillary, it's the other way around. Veins are low-pressure systems. You're not having that push behind um, of the blood. By the time it gets through the capillary blood, it bl- the capillary bed, it doesn't have a whole lot of pressure anymore. And so osmotic pressure is ruling on the venous end. Water is moving back in. Blood volume is maintained because water that may have been pushed out on the artery side of the capillary bed is drawn back in on the venous side. So moving on to venules and veins. Venules are what connect the capillaries and uh, bring them into veins. They are thinner than the arterioles. They don't have the three layers of um, tissue that make up the walls, though they do, or they don't have the connective tissue on the outside, but they do have some of the smooth muscle and elastic tissue, sort of the middle layer. Veins were back to the three tunics, but again, the middle wall of smooth muscle layer is not particularly well developed. It is there. Your veins can undergo constriction What's most important about your veins, though, is that you have flap-like valves, very similar to the semilunar valves in the great arteries from the heart, and so this allows us to get our blood back from our extremities to our heart. Blood also, the veins also function as a reservoir for your blood, as this next slide will show. So this graph shows where the blood is found around your body. It's, it's unequally distributed. You have some in the blood vessels that are involved in your lungs and some, of course, in your heart and some in your arteries, but only 13%, 7% in your capillaries, but 64% of the blood at any one moment is sitting in a vein or a venule. And so it serves as a reservoir that can be activated if the blood pressure or volume of blood in the arteries is too low. We have a number of sensory receptors in your arteries that are there to keep track of of what's happening, and one of which keeps track of of your blood pressure. They're called baroreceptors. And so if the baroreceptor says that the blood pressure has dropped, that there may not be enough blood volume moving through arteries, then veins and venules will get the message to constrict. The smooth muscle around those vessels will contract, and so it will push the blood back from the body into back into circulation through the heart and thereby raising the amount of blood that is being pushed through the arteries and hopefully bring you back closer to homeostatic uh, situation for so concerns your blood volume. Now speaking of blood pressure, well blood pressure is the force that's exerted on blood vessel walls. So Blood pressure, we're really talking about arterial blood pressure because I've said several times that the veins are a low pressure system. Blood pressure will rise when ventricles contract and falls when, fall when the ventricles relax. And we use the word systolic pressure, and yes, you should see the connection there to systole, which is the pressure when your ventricles contract, and diastolic pressure, again connected to diastole, when they're in a state of relaxation. So to put this in a graph form, you can see here we're starting off with the aorta on the left and going down to the vena cava, coming back into the heart at the other side. And so the millimeters of of mercury is a standard way of measuring pressure. Um, It's just an indication of if if your blood was in a barometer, this is how much it would push up the um, mercury. If you remember from uh, chemistry, one atmosphere is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury. So the blood pressure inside your body is not quite as much pressure as is coming down on you from the atmosphere, which makes sense. So anyway, as you see that as your each one of these um, pulses, peaks of these waves that we see tracked here in this first section is, re- is a indication of the um, contraction of the heart. So here your heart has contracted and sent a pulse and it sent another pulse and sent another and another contraction. And on these first few pulses that are very close to the aorta, you can see this little notch, the dichrotic notch, which is an indication of the blood the blood backflowing and closing those semilunar valves and also the little bit of blood that goes out right away when it comes into the aorta to the coronary arteries. But then when you get further away from the heart, the peaks are much more smooth. So, you know, we get down, by the time we get down just before the capillaries, we're really not seeing any kind of pressure fluctuation anymore. 
but there's quite a bit of very high pressure up through the um, into your muscles. So as your arteries are built to uh, be able to absorb this, they're very, very elastic so that they can expand and then bound back and contract and push that blood on to the next part of your body and then expand again when the next push of blood comes from the heart and then contract so that the blood moves forward. There are several places where you can feel a pulse. I'm sure that you have tried either the radial artery, right, uh, kind of in the soft spot by your wrist, and or the carotid artery underneath um, your neck. You may have seen somebody's pulse beating the temporal artery on the, the side of their forehead when they're angry. And if you've ever crossed your legs and been, you know, kind of very relaxed and looked at your toe, you might actually see the bottom, of your lower limb pulsing ba because of the um, pulse coming through the popliteal artery behind your knee. The other um, pulse point that's very important for doctors is down here in the dorsalis pedis artery down on top of the foot because being able to feel a pulse in this part of your body tells you that the blood supply is good all the way down to the, the very end of the lower extremity. But in conditions where vascular tissue has been compromised, somebody that has suffered from um, diabetes or some other vascular disease, you, when you lose, you're no longer able to feel that pulse in the foot. It's telling you that blood is not getting down to that part of the body with any kind of pressure behind it. There are several things that influence blood pressure. If your blood volume increases, then blood pressure will also increase. And I use that example from the uh, blood reserve in the veins. If they constrict, then the blood volume that is reaching the arteries where blood pressure is uh, calculated will increase. If your heart race rate increases and you're putting out more, it's a higher cardiac output, that will increase blood pressure. If the heart is able to expand and contract more, it pushes more blood. And uh, the heart responds with... If more blood comes into the heart and the heart um, expands to a greater extent with that increased volume coming in, then it contracts more vigorously going back so that it, it is able to adjust with an increase in heart rate and increase in blood flow as you are exercising. This is a very good thing that your heart will contract stronger if it has been expanded a little bit more. So this was the volume. Each one of those contractions would be called a stroke. So a stroke volume will increase as your blood flow increases and more blood than is coming into the heart, especially with exercises, with exercise. If for some reason the resistance in the extremities, the peripheral um, areas of your body increases because of constriction there perhaps, then uh, blood pressure will increase. And if your blood viscosity increases, then you will also see blood pressure going up. This can happen when someone is diabetic and their blood is being filled with sugar. Sugar is a large molecule and it will slow down the blood flow. It will increase the viscosity and cause an increase in blood pressure. And that's one of the reasons why there are a number of cardiac issues that come out uh, along with having diabetes. That a lot of the uh, unfortunate side effects are related to, car to the cardiovascular system. We also mentioned blood viscosity increases when somebody is um, having more erythropoietin producing bloods, red blood cells because they're at a higher altitude or if they're someone using illegally trying to increase their red blood cell because they're an endurance athlete. These are things that also impact on blood pressure, which is why this is a dangerous practice. Homeostatic control of blood pressure is maintained by a negative feedback loop. So this shows you both ways if blood pressure, blood, blood pressure rises or blood pressure falls, what is happening in your body. So if blood pressure changes, baroreceptors, which are found in the carotid and aortic arteries, uh, are able to pick up that information. They're able to sense what's happening with blood pressure and then send messages through the central nervous system to the sympathetic and the parasympathetic tracts, depending upon what you need to happen. If your blood pressure has ri is rising, then you want to slow down the heart rate so you want to use the parasympathetic nervous system to, to inhibit the heart rate and turn off any sympathetic impulses, which are uh, involved in accelerating heart rate. 
You also want to send a message to the blood vessels to allow vasodilation, so they will expand and increase the amount of space that the blood has to occupy, which will all end up lowering blood pressure. So the CO here is for cardiac output, and the R is for resistance. Cardiac output then is affected by how much the heart beats, and the resistance is affected by how tightly the blood vessels are contracted. And so the, the, all these steps would work together to lower blood pressure back to normal range. If blood pressure is too low, basically the opi opposite happens, that your baroreceptors say, wait a minute, this is too low, let's send a message to the accelerator center of the, the uh, central nervous system, Let's stimulate the um, heart rate, send some messages through your sympathetic nervous system to have your heart rate go up to increase your cardiac output. Let's constrict these blood vessels so that the amount of um, space available is smaller and so the pressure feels higher and so then we end up again with blood pressure returning to the normal range. Along with barrel receptors, there are chemoreceptors that are picking up carbon dioxide levels, for example, in your blood, and will also then influence the resistance, the peripheral resistance by vasodilation or constriction. So if you are exercising and carbon dioxide levels are rising in your blood, then the chemoreceptors trigger a relaxation of the muscles in your blood vessels so that more blood will flow to your muscles so that, that they can get the oxygen they need. So they, they vasodilate the arterioles to increase the blood flow to the blood mass, the muscles in your body. So these work together again as a negative feedback loop, as do most things do in the homeostatic systems. Hypertension is a consistent blood pressure reading above 140 over 90. And so this is your systolic blood pressure, how much pressure is being pushed out when the heart contracts. This is your diastolic blood pressure, how much pressure is left in the artery after the heart relaxes. Normal levels are below 120 over 80. So if you are consistently getting readings above 140 over 90, then you are in a hypertensive state. Hypertension, or high blood pressure, is known as the silent killer because it rarely gives any other signs of its existence. So you cannot look at someone and say, oh, your blood pressure is high. Until it gets extremely high, there are really no outside signs. But because it is putting this extra stress on the cardiovascular system and other systems that are involved in a very close relationship with the blood, like your kidneys, Hypertension is a cause factor for stroke and for heart disease, for kidney failure, and diseases of the blood vessels, things like aneurysms, um, other things that are, are your, un, your blood vessels are not functioning at top efficiency. Hypertension, probably luckily we could say, can often be uh, controlled by making lifestyle choices. So following a healthy diet where you're eating less processed foods because those are the ones that have sodium, not as salt, but sodium as food preservatives. Um, and a high level of sodium, of course, would put more sodium ions in your bloodstream, which would continue, which would contribute to bringing more water by osmosis into your bloodstream. So by avoiding too much sodium, by avoiding processed foods, having regular exercise, keeping your weight at a healthy level, don't smoke, don't drink too much alcohol. All these things can make a big impact pact on hypertension. My own husband was running very close to this level. He was having high diastolic readings of close to 100. His systolic was not um, too terribly high, but his diastolic was. But he was able to lose 40 pounds this summer, and it did bring his blood pressure down to much more normal levels which I was quite thankful because he was also showing that he was in stage one kidney failure, which to me was quite worrisome. If you are not able to make uh, an effect on your blood pressure by lifestyle changes, but perhaps you're suffering from other diseases and so they're just, they are not enough, then doctors will prescribe diuretic medications, which continue to pull water out of the blood in order to lower blood pressure. There are, of course, potential side effects to that. You're not dealing with the root cause of the high blood pressure, and so, and you perhaps are leaving blood slightly more viscous, so there could be some issues. But um, sometimes you have to rely on diuretic medications because lifestyle is not enough. Now let's look at your veins. The blood returns to the heart through the veins, and there's no push. As I said, by the time it goes through the capillary bed, that's a very low pressure system. So how does the blood blood get through your veins back to your heart. If it's coming from your big toe, that's a long way away and it's uphill against gravity. 
So basically, we've got two pump systems that do this. Our skeletal muscles provide a pump, and the valves that exist in the veins help in this by preventing backflow. And then we also have a pump with our breathing by the change in the pressure within the body, helping to bring the blood back to the heart. And then again, venoconstriction, constriction of your veins, can help return blood to the heart. These two pictures illustrate the two pumps, the muscle pump and the respiratory pump that help bring the, the blood back, just kind of help you get it in your head a little bit more clearly. You can see that there are two valves indicated here on this vein running through the lower extremity. And so the um, skeletal muscles that are surrounding the vein when they are contracted, like we see here in this middle position when somebody moves their up on their rises up on their toe, the blood will be pushed up the vein and it basically is moving from one area that is um, delineated at the end by a valve into the next area that has a door at the end by the valve. And so any blood that starts off down here will be pushed up into the next level, kind of like climbing a ladder one step at a time, and then will be worked up the rest of the way towards the heart as you continue to contract muscles in your extremities, legs and arms. The respiratory pump, illustrated on the right here, when you um, take a breath, your abdomen or not your abdomen, your diaphragm is pulled downward, and so it enlarges the chest cavity, and by doing so, it lowers the pressure inside the chest cavity, and so air isn't really pulled in by our bodies, but it pushes its way in because it is in greater pressure outside the body than it is inside the body. But this also, the lowering of the pressure in the thoracic cavity also will pull the blood because, again, this is a lower pressure area inside the cavity, higher pressure area on the outside, just like things move down concentration gradients from higher concentration to lower concentration, things move down pressure gradients from higher pressure to lower pressure. So these two pictures help illustrate these two very important ways that we help pump our venous blood up our body so that it can return to the heart and return back into the next cycle around of our circulation. You need to know a little bit about the major blood vessels in the body. So we're going to start with the arteries, or the aorta, the big blood vessel. And it comes, as it comes out of the heart, of course, it, it has several branches that happen right away. I probably should put this one first. The coronary arteries come off first, almost immediately outside of the heart. They, there's one to the right and one to the left side of the heart. And then you have the brachial cephalic and the left common carotid and the subclavian arteries that come off on the arch of the aorta, heading the brachiocephalic heads, uh, heads to the right side of the body with the arm and the head, left common carotid to the head, left subclavian, left arm. So for whatever reason, you've got two arteries heading to the left side of your body, but only one to the right. Then the thoracic section of the aorta, of course, covers the thoracic cavity. The abdominal section of the aorta covers the abdominal cavity. And then when you get to the, the brim of the pelvis, it splits into two iliac arteries because it needs to go down two legs. So here's a diagram of the major arteries. And so if we start here, you know, we've got the aorta coming off. Um, the arch of the aorta, and you can see those first, you can't really see the coronary arteries except in the heart itself, and then the, the, as I mentioned, the brachiocephalic and the common, left common carotid, and then the subclavian artery um, going off immediately from that arch of the aorta. Then the aorta comes down behind the heart and travels to the lower rest of your body. You've got thoracic arteries coming off here. Um, oh, sorry, the thoracic Aorta is here, so you've got arteries that are not really shown going into the rib cage. Then the next little uh, knobs here, which we you know are not extended to the full arteries, are just sort of showing you where they start. Are the celiac trunk, which goes to your stomach, the gastric uh, pancreas. Then the mesenteric arteries, you've got a superior and inferior. These go to your intestines. The renal artery goes to the kidneys, the gonadal artery, artery goes to reproductive organs, and so this whole section is the abdominal section. And then when it gets down here to the top of the pelvis, it will split into the two common iliac artery. And you can see, you know, that some of the regions of the body, again, are, are showing up in these names. If we continue down from the iliac artery, you've got a femoral artery. There's there are actually two sides. There's deep and uh, superficial. This is the one where I was talking about how heart catheterization goes in. So you can imagine a doctor putting in a, you know, angioplasty um, 
probe in this part of the artery and then it traces its way back up the heart, up towards the heart. Uh, I mentioned the popliteal artery where you can see your pulse point happening. You've got arteries that travel down in front of the tibia um, all the way down to your feet. On the arm, the, the radial artery, this is the one that you feel when you're taking your pulse. It's right um, on this little section of your wrist. And um, your brachial artery, if you back when you used to take first aid, they taught you how to put pressure on the upper arm right here to stop bleeding further down on the arm. They don't seem to do that in first aid anymore. And of course, just like you have the ulnar, there's an artery running right around that bone. So probably it's fairly easy for you to identify these arteries if you remember the names of the bones that are as part of your skeletal system or the regions. One I do want to mention are the vertebral artery. Um, we didn't talk so much about the shape of the vertebrae, just basically mentioned it in the video, but in the cervical vertebrae, you've got the, um, if I just kind of draw a vertebrae here, that's the body where the weight rests, and then we've got some lateral spines, and then this is the dorsal spine. On your cervical vertebrae, there are transverse foramen, little holes on these lateral spines. And this is where your vertebral artery travels to the brain. So it comes off the aorta, and um, actually it splits off the carotid artery, and so it travels up, threading its way through the cervical vertebrae to enter the brain, more towards the um, dorsal side of the brain, whereas your carotid artery is coming up more up the midline. In your venous system, we've talked about the veins that are going, you know, I didn't put pulmonary on the other one, but you've talked about the um, pulmonary trunk, which is, of course, the artery going out to the lungs from the heart, and then the veins, the pulmonary veins, returning the oxygenated blood. The cardiac veins, the ones that will collect the venous blood on the heart itself, and then these two big superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, which are collecting all the veins from the body. So you can see from this picture, the veins really track, the larger veins at least, really track very closely to the arteries, and you do tend to find them paired up. Um, there's a little more variation in the collection point of the sort of the venules going into the veins, but for in many cases they are following right along the side. Um, so instead of the carotid, you've got a juggler vein going up your neck. I'm pretty sure that you've heard about that. We're going to be talking about the hepatic vein, the hepatic portal system later on. Basically, the top half of your body up through your um, upper abdominal muscles are all going to feed into the superior vena cava, so your arms and your head and your neck and your thoracic cavity and the upper part of your abdomen. All of the blood from that part is going to drain into the superior vena cava, and then the lower half of your body is going to feed into the inferior vena cava, and we saw those when we were doing our dissecting of our hearts. If you've ever given blood, you know that they're taking the blood from a vein found here in the antecubital region, the inside of your elbow joint. And so the main veins that are being looked at to see which one seems to have a good, good uh, size and a good supply of blood would be the basilic vein or the cephalic vein or the median cubital vein, which sort of is the one that cuts across. So that's where your blood is drawn from if you're giving blood for a blood test. Cardiovascular system is one part of your body where your lifestyle can have a drastic effect, and heart disease is certainly still a major killer. Heart disease and hypertension are major killers in the United States. And healthy eating and regular exercise can have a very rapid effect on the health of your cardiovascular system. I, you know, I've been promoting exercise all along and, and healthy diet, and I'll just say it again, that, that it really does make a big difference. Your healthy food choices specific to the cardiovascular system can change your blood levels of, lip, of lipids or fats in the blood and glucose. They also, by eating fruits and vegetables, deeply color food, colored food, you provide antioxidants, which prevent cell damage by neutralizing some of the um, leftover waste products of cell, normal cell metabolism. But these are uh, chemicals that can go on to cause damage if they are not taken care of right away. And so what you eat by providing antioxidants and the food choices that uh, provides that neutralizing chemical is ready and waiting to take care of it. And then healthy food choices are involved in maintaining a healthy weight and preventing, preventing hypertension and diabetes, which because of their effect on the body then go on to sort of spiral into greater um, and greater effects on the cardiovascular system. 
Regular exercise can increase your ability to do exercise. So this is what this increased exercise tolerance means. It makes your muscles stronger. It makes your heart stronger. It contracts better. Your, dial, your blood vessels respond better to signals to dilate. Um, and in fact, over a period of time, if you're engaging in aerobic exercise, increasing your heart rate and breathing rate, you actually can increase the density of capillaries in the parts of your muscles that are being exercised. Regular exercise, because it burns calories, can help maintain a healthy body weight. And that, I mean, healthy body weight just comes up over and over again in preventing diseases. Exercise reduces stress hormones. Stress hormones we've now seen are involved in inflammation. Inflammation are a chronic state of kind of uh, worry and, and, you know, like something's going to go wrong. The, the cortisol and other uh, stress hormones are not good for you because your body does not work well if it's constantly on red alert. And as I... Um, it also, regular exercise helps promote in the blood the type of lipoprotein, the high-density lipoprotein, that seems to have not only a preventative but perhaps a reduction effect in getting rid of the lipoprotein, the low-density lipoprotein that is the one most closely associated with the buildup of plaques inside the blood stream, blood stream which causes atherosclerosis, as I mentioned in the heart um, video. And then finally, regular exercise increases insulin sensitivity in body cells, which means you're less likely to develop diabetes. More and more research is showing us that preventing heart disease is a lifelong um, event. It's something that uh, cardiac problems start developing very early, especially given the sort of the standard American diet, um, which some people have you know, used that an acronym for SAD, Standard American Diet, to express that it's a sad diet. It's not a very good choice in many ways of the, uh, the amount of emphasis that we place on processed food. So the um, Bogalusa Heart Study, which is from Louisiana, started in the 1970s, is one of the very good, um, so far as research data following, I think we're now up to 16,000 young people from early on in their life through um, adulthood and, and in many cases to the, to the end of their life. And so some of the things that have come out of that study is that fatty buildup begins forming before you really hit adolescence, that choices that are made in childhood will have an impact on your cardiovascular conditioning, and that the, um, this backs up the fact that looking at your numbers of cholesterol and total, uh, total cholesterol and the uh, low-density lipoproteins, or this is the bad cholesterol, do predict the degree of plaque that forms in blood vessels that uh, if you're overweight as a child, you're more likely to become overweight as an adult, and that the, this overweight or obesity also then is lined right up with elevated blood cholesterol and elevated blood pressure and follows along somebody if they are overweight as a child and overweight as an adult. They have high blood cholesterol as a child and high blood cholesterol as an adult. And so um, just it's, as I've said before, you know, you are what you eat. You really do need to be thinking about what kind of choices you are making and what kind of impact it's going to have on you. There are three special circulations in the body we want to mention. The first one is the arterial circulation of the brain, then the hepatic portal circulation, and finally the circulation that happens before birth in the fetus. The arterial circulation of the brain involves something we call the circle of Willis or the cerebral arterial circle. And in this case, the anterior and posterior cerebral arteries that are coming up from the vertebral artery that's coming up through the vertebrae join with the internal carotid arteries, which are coming up from the um, common carotid, left and right common carotids, carotid arteries in your neck, and they form an anastomosis, a, a network of blood vessels which surround the pituitary gland sort of in that uh, middle of your brain, right down at the base of the diencephalon. Um, and so this, what this does is it creates redundancies. It recreates other ways that blood can move around your brain and so that if something happens in one part of your brain, you're not losing huge chunks of brain matter, that if a blood clot, a stroke occurs, uh, there's some way that your brain can compensate for that because you can divert blood through one of these other pathways. So here's a diagram of the circle of Willis. So you can see that we have the... Um, if we follow along the carotid arteries coming up over here, which one's coming up, and so then we get the carotid artery on the side, and then the vertebral artery coming up sort of in the central, and so then they join in with this circle here and allow, um, as I said, several ways that blood can flow. So if you've got some, you know, a blockage here, things can still get around 
to most of your blood by going in the other direction. The second special circulation is what happens in your liver, the hepatic por portal circulation. It is interesting, the liver is the only organ that has a double blood supply. It has both arteries and veins bringing blood to that organ. Normally just arteries bring blood to an organ and veins bring it away. But we have, blood, we have veins bringing blood to the liver because the liver is where we process the nutrients that we get from our digestive system. And so it is in the liver that glucose is turned into glycogen and that amino acids and lipids are changed so that they can be used by the cells and vitamins are stored such as vitamin A or vitamin D. The liver is also where toxic substances are detoxified and drugs are modified so that they actually do something useful in our body. So that the, the liver is what's doing all of this processing and it has to treat the blood before it goes back through the heart. It comes from the intestinal system right to the liver. So arterial and venous blood is actually mixing together when it enters the liver, providing not only the, a place for the nutrients to be metabolized and worked on, but it also is providing the oxygen to the liver cells. One place I read said that 70% of the oxygen is really coming from the venous blood when it, con when it concerns your liver. The, the mixing and the um, metabolism, the absorption and changing of nutrients take place in liver cells called hepatocytes. And it happens because of a highly permeable section of blood vessel called a sinusoid. This is the most permeable type of capillary. There is lots of space in between cells where the um, nutrients, these larger molecules, can actually leave the blood vessel and go into the interstitial fluid and then be moved into the hepatocytes that are surrounding that. In the walls of the sinusoids, we have specialized macrophages that are uh, able to take care of any pathogens that may have been absorbed with the nutrients. Uh, were not just bacteria, perhaps, that was not destroyed in the stomach, but is still there present in that mix of, of um, digested food. So we don't want that, those harmful pathogens to be moving through our body. So the liver also takes care of that by these specialized cells, the Kupfer cells that are found actually in the blood vessel walls in the liver. So here are some pictures illustrating this hepatic portal system. We've got the portal vein where we're bringing in the nutrient-rich supply, mixing with the blood coming through these arteries here, and these are both feeding into then the, the actual structure of the liver, which is made of long, flat sections of liver cells, plates of hepatocytes, and then this purpley section are the sinusoids, the especially leaky forms of capillaries that are found in the liver. And then it has a close-up version over here where you can see both you know, the veins and the arteries are, are coming in, emptying into the sinusoids so the blood is being mixed. And within the, this leaky section, then that's when all of the nutrients are moving out of the bloodstream and into the interstitial space next to the liver cells because the metabolism is happening in the hepatocytes. That's where things are being changed and uh, put into storage and broken down or whatever needs to be done. And then in the walls of the sinusoids, we have the Kupfer cells that are there to take care of any pathogens. And then finally, I just want to talk about circulation before birth. For the developing baby, the maternal blood supply is what's providing the oxygen and the nutrients because the blood, um, there's no ability to get oxygen from the air. The lungs are still under development. Fetal blood can also carry more oxygen because there's a different kind of hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin is much more, has a great, great deal more affinity for oxygen, so it, it is picks it up much more easily. And there's more hemoglobin in the blood of the fetus before birth than there is in somebody after birth. Their little bit of blood is needed by the lungs for growth, but essentially they're not doing their job as lungs. So we have two bypass blood vessels that skip the lungs and the liver. The ductus venosus skips the liver, and the ductus arteriosus skips the um, lungs for the most part. And then inside the heart, we have the foramen ovale, which provides an opening between the two atrium so that the blood will, again, not spend time going to lungs that are non-functional. So here's a diagram, and so we've got blood coming from the mother going to the heart, so it gets to be called the umbilical vein. Um, but as it comes in to the body, uh, you'll see that it, it kind of skips the ductus venosus, is skipping over the liver, 
dropping directly on the other side of the liver to head up towards the heart through the inferior vena cava. And then when the blood enters the heart, enters the, the um, right atrium here, it can some of it will go into the right ventricle and get pumped through the pulmonary trunk, but a good portion of it is just going to slide right over through this hole, through this foramen oval, and end up in the left atrium and then down to the left ventricle and out through the aorta. The little bit that does go into the right ventricle and starts up the pulmonary trunk, some of that gets diverted directly into the aorta by the ductus arteriosus. So we're skipping the lungs except for a little bit that's coming down the pulmonary trunk so that the lung cells can have a little bit of blood to develop. We're skipping the liver. We're mixing rich, you can see this red blood coming down the umbilical vein, um, you know, oxygen-rich blood from the mother with the deoxygenated blood that's circulating through the baby. It's being mixed together, which is why most of this is sort of purpley in color, um, and then being sent out around the body like it normally would after it gets pushed out into the aorta. The placenta, which is the connecting point between the mother and the baby, and we will talk about development at the end of this uh, year, is it doesn't, it's, there's, the placental membrane is the place where things are moving from cells of the mother, blood cells of the mother, and blood cells of the baby, but there's no blood mixing. Things are moving across cell membranes, but they are not, blood is not moving from one and to the other. So that covers what I wanted to talk about with blood vessels. So this is the last video for this unit. Um, so we'll finish up cardiovascular information at our next class.